As children, we are taught the difference between right and wrong. We develop consciences. The chief executive officer of one of our great American chemical companies would never think of dumping his garbage on his neighbor's front lawn. But his company dumps dioxin in the rivers that belong to all of us. He and the corporations of his fellow CEOs, many of whom share each other's boards of directors, unremittingly pump chemicals into our air that then descend upon the earth as acid rain. Every minute of every day, millions of decent people perform indecent acts on behalf of the corporations for which they work, acts they would never commit in their own names. In the days of the black slave, a relationship, although often unspeakable and heinous, existed between master and slave. Master and slave were chained together. Neither was free. Evil as the best of these relationships were, they were nevertheless human relationships. The slaveholder, if he had a conscience, had to answer to his conscience. The slaveholder, if he had a soul, had to recognize it as his own. Cruelty and exploitation were carried out face to face. But what about this new master of ours? We are chained, but by invisible chains, to nothing. We are enslaved, but when we fall sick and can no longer work, we are retired without enough to support even our dignity. Across the land, our corporate masters employ every trick, every connivance, to cheat millions out of the pensions they have earned in exchange for having contributed their lives to the new king's profit. Like chickens in a chicken coop, we believe we are free. We can squawk and crow all we want. We can fuss and fight and strut and screw and compete for the scraps the farmer throws us. But we are still in the chicken coop, and the farmer gets the eggs. It is commonplace in America these days for corporations to strip their employees of their hard bargain for and dearly earned pensions and other benefits as a part of the king's insatiable quest for profit. Profit is everything. The never-ending search for profit transcends all moral considerations. Numbers on the bottom line, not principles of right or wrong, dictate the consciences of most corporations. Indeed, the bottom line is their conscience. Since corporations have no souls and no commitment to the human race, corporations will always commit wrongs in their unquenchable quest for profit. The corporate structure may be a necessary evil to gather the capital required to carry on business, but the corporate structure itself is inherently evil. It is evil in the same way that a person without a conscience is evil. Psychologists call such persons sociopaths. Our most cold-blooded killers are usually so classified. Manson is a sociopath. Many times I have seen these wretched creatures with their empty eyes sitting in the courtroom as the state psychologist explains to the court and the jury that somehow they have been cast into this world without a conscience. There is no guiding mechanism to keep them from committing wrongs, and science has not yet devised a means by which to graft a conscience onto them. But we can graft a conscience onto our mammoth corporations. Every large corporation should be required to seat on its board an equal number of ordinary people, people who have no pecuniary interest in the corporation's activities. These people who will act as the corporation's conscience would be selected at random from the tax rolls of the community in which the corporation carries on its principal business. These conscience members of the corporate board will see that the rights of the corporation's employees are preserved, that their pension funds are not raided, that the workers receive fair wages, that their benefits are equitable, and that the corporation acts in accordance with every standard of good citizenship. Corporations should be held accountable to people in proportion to their power. For power, of whatever magnitude, demands a corresponding quotient of responsibility. We do not hold the dependent child to the same level of responsibility as his more competent parent. We do not hold the family pup to the same level of responsibility as the child. 
Yet people often exercise responsibility far out of proportion to their power. Take Sam Jones, for instance. He runs the local filling station. He obeys the law, he respects his neighbors, he works extra hours to put his children through school, serves on the jury when called, gives to the United Fund and his church, and he supports a community project for the homeless. Why, then, shouldn't a corporation that supplies the gasoline that Sam sells, that profits from Sam's labor, and whose financial power is several million times greater than Sam's, also be responsible in proportion to its power? Shouldn't that corporation strictly comply with all of our laws? Shouldn't it be acutely aware of its responsibility toward its neighbors, making certain it doesn't dump its pollutants on them? Must it not serve the many communities it touches in the same fashion that Sam Jones serves his? Shouldn't that corporation reinvest its money in these communities in proportion to the gross profits derived from each? Shouldn't it take part in the education of the community's children, granting scholarships to those in need as Sam has educated his? Shouldn't that corporation provide the community the wherewithal to improve the community just as Sam has? In the end, a corporate conscience would prove good for business. Employees who are happy, who are treated with respect as persons, not as digits, not as expendable rags, will produce more. Corporations who act responsibly will be viewed by the consumer with a more tolerant eye. We can change the corporate nature. We can make corporate officers as well as employees both civilly and criminally liable for their violations of the law. If the human agencies of corporations were held responsible for the corporation's acts, a workman would refuse to violate the law for fear the crime, say dumping pollutants in the river, would be chargeable against him, and the corporate executive, for the same reason, would refuse to order the dumping in the first place. I have argued that we are more nearly a corporate oligarchy than a democracy. Corporate money elects our presidents and selects our congressmen, our cabinet members, and our judges. Corporate money has bought the country, and the question that begs answering is how to remove the near-total control of non-voting corporations and return it to voting citizens. The ancient Chinese thought that no leader should be permitted to seek power. They believed that those who seek power need power, and that those who need power ought not to be entrusted with it. I agree. Moreover, the perennial complaint expressed by nearly every citizen at election time is, why in a country of over a quarter of a billion people can't we come up with candidates better qualified than these? Plato argued in his Republic that our representatives should be selected at random from the whole population, that from a fund of all qualified voters we simply draft our representatives. Those whose names come up in the selection process would be required by law to serve. By this method we could draw as many women as men. More poor and middle-class representatives would be chosen than those who are economically privileged. We would have proportionately as many members of minorities as exist in the whole population. Indeed, by such a process of random selection, we would obtain a house that truly represents the demographics of the nation. These representatives would serve one term, perhaps four years. During their term they would receive an adequate salary and the jobs they left would be protected by law. A representative committee selected by the body, from the body, would choose our candidates for president, presumably the best qualified men and women in the country, those with the best history, the best experience, the best training, the very best that America has produced. Such leaders would have values consistent with those of the people themselves. That people, not money, that justice, not profit, are the first considerations, that progress is realized when we feed and house and educate our citizens, that progress is realized when we preserve the earth. These candidates so selected would be drafted to stand for election, and the people, after they had been fully informed concerning their qualifications, would select one of their number to serve as president for a single term. Some observe that such a method of selecting our representatives bears with it the danger that some will not be qualified to represent us. But we have survived in a system for over 200 years where most who represent us are either not qualified or are committed to interests antithetical to our own. I find it easier to trust the school teacher or the bulldozer operator over the professional politicians I have known. I would more readily trust the waitress and the high school custodian to know more about right and wrong 
than any I know who occupy high seats in Washington. This great cross-section like jurors would bring to government a knowledge of the human condition not often found in the elitists who hold office. And this great cross-section would terminate forever our representatives' pathetic indenture to the power of the money that hoisted them into office. This selection process puts our view of democracy to a true test. Either we are a democracy, and as a consequence we are willing to vest the people's power in the people themselves, or we are not. Either we believe people are qualified to govern themselves, or at last we must admit that we do not believe this at all, and that our preachments to the contrary have been only a part of a cruel and deluding two-century swindle of our freedom. To be sure, despite its manifold defects, we love our country. It is ours. We make our living here, a better living than most people elsewhere in the world. We pride ourselves in being Americans. We zealously guard our rights to engage freely in commerce, to realize a profit and to speak and write freely. We are patriotic, loyal to our country and to the ideals it symbolizes. When faced with the system's faults, we may acknowledge them with a shrug of the shoulders and reply with the old cliché, the system may not be perfect, but it is the best system ever invented by man. Indeed, our system may be the greatest in the world, but to those who are forgotten by the system, for the over 25 percent of the children of this country who go to bed undernourished, the system is not good enough. For the woman who cannot support her children because she has been discriminated against at her workplace, for the citizen who cannot feed his family because he does not have sufficient education to compete in the marketplace, for the worker who cannot retire because he has been cheated of his pension, for the innocent who must walk the plank of no return through the monstrous criminal justice system, for the people who are lied to and cheated, who are poisoned, and the earth that is polluted for profit, for all of them who at last become all of us, the system is not good enough. Wealth at last is translatable into cans of beans and blankets. Wealth is translatable into life, into health, and into freedom. We would think it madness were we to visit a man who had already acquired ten square miles of canned beans, the cases of beans stacked twenty stories high, with an endless train of trucks laden with yet more beans entering the compound, while the compound itself, always expanding, was protected by a surrounding fence, and thousands of guards to keep the starving outside. What are you doing, we might ask the bean man. Can't you see the people are starving? This is free enterprise, the bean man might reply. I know, but you can only eat so many beans, and after all, you can't take the beans with you. I'm leaving the beans to my kids. Besides, I use beans to keep score. That's my hobby. I'm a bean counter. What do you mean, keep score, a pale, gaunt woman in rags asks through a crack in the fence. Can't you see that my child is hungry? Go to work, the bean man says. I worked for my beans. You work for yours. And don't forget... I'm giving ten cans of beans to the scholarship fund of my university next month. That corporations like the hog should acquire more and more, just more for more sake, while the powerless of the world do without food, or shelter, or education, or medical care, at some point transcends reason and mocks justice. Such evils can be accepted only as we accept the injustices of any religion. We accept such injustices on faith, that our religion is inherently just. But more, merely for more's sake, is not free enterprise. More for endless more finally becomes madness. In its perfect state, free enterprise calls upon the human species to rise to the divine. Above all, it demands freedom. Its soul is the soul of freedom. It strives to free us so that we may exhibit our grace, our creativity, the fruit of our love, indeed the product of our virtue. It frees us to inquire, to explore, to pursue the muses of both art and science. 
It permits us to chase our dreams, different as they may be from our neighbors. It lauds our blessed individuality. It allows us not only to acquire our needs, but to fulfill our avaricious longings. Yet free enterprise never contemplated that the ant should compete for survival against a herd of stainless steel elephants. Let us return for a moment to our definition of insanity, a disassociation from reality. And from our insane perspective, consider how we view success. We pity the person with an insatiable appetite, who as a result of his disorder becomes so obese he can no longer waddle, even to the dinner table. But we laud those who suffer from a similar greed for money. We shun those who are sexually insatiable, referring to them as satyrs or sluts or nymphomaniacs. But we hold those with an insatiable craving for money in the greatest esteem. Those who are addicted to alcohol or drugs are treated as ill and seen as socially unacceptable. But those who are addicted to the endless acquisition of wealth are endlessly admired. Money also is seen as a desirable substitute for most other worthy human traits. For example, an ugly person with money is often coveted as a mate, whereas an ugly person without money is usually not, leading us to conclude that money stands for beauty. A dullard who never exhibited an original thought in his life, but who has money, is more likely to be found in the higher echelons of the system than a person with original and startling ideas who has no money at all, leading us to conclude that money stands for creativity. A product that sells for more is considered to contain more intrinsic worth than a better product that sells for less, leading us to conclude that money stands for quality. An artist whose work is common and mundane, but who can exchange it for money, is considered a better artist than one whose creations are original and unique but who cannot sell his work, leading us to conclude that money stands for taste. Those who have money are considered wise, while those who have little are often thought to be fools, leading us to conclude that money stands for sagacity. Those who do nothing but permit their money to earn money are considered to be virtuous, while those who have no money and who pursue none are often considered lazy. If one steals a little money, he is considered a common thief. But if one steals huge amounts of money, he is considered a successful businessman. Indeed, we are insane. Yet our species displays a divine connection to the light and grace of the universe. Our poets and artists are inspired, though little heard. Our tenderness can be as pure and perfect as the bloom of the lily. Our love can be passionate, our courage the courage of the gods. We are both mechanical and spontaneous, lifeless and creative, insensitive and exquisitely aware. We can hate and adore with equal force. We can be both intelligent and inexplicably obtuse. And we can be maddeningly objective or objectively mad, it being beyond our ability to predict which trait will be evidenced at any moment. By reason of having been born on this earth, human beings are endowed with certain inherent rights, no less divine than those of a squirrel, who acquired similar rights when it was born in the forest. By natural law, squirrel and man alike are entitled to sufficient food and adequate shelter. By natural law, the squirrel possesses its hole in the tree and is provided the opportunity to fill its nest with nuts. If man indeed rules the earth, why then should the human creature be entitled to less than any of the other members of the society of creatures? Is not something quite awry when man, allegedly the most intelligent, the supposed occupant of the highest place on the totem, grants himself less respect than the squirrel? that for two million years primitive man should have provided food and shelter for himself and all the members of his tribe, while civilized man with a vastly greater ability to do so has not, suggests a social sickness yet to be attended to. That civilized man strives mightily to build enough new penal facilities to house the bulging criminal population 
and does little to house the innocent homeless suggests a social aberration yet to be confronted. When nature is properly in balance, everything growing is respected. The squirrel may become food for the owl and the fawn food for the wolf. But neither owl nor wolf stack up corpse after corpse in front of its lair to keep score. The respect of creatures for creatures is founded upon the natural law that recognizes that all life is interdependent and is therefore entitled to dignity and respect. The similarity of the ideals of free enterprise to the jungle have often been observed. But in nature, the laws in place do not permit the children to destroy the mother, or to say it otherwise, the occupants of the earth to destroy the earth itself. By virtue of having been born, every child in this country, indeed on the face of the earth, is entitled to the same rights as the squirrel. Such child is entitled to a decent shelter over his head and adequate food to nourish her growth. Under natural law, every creature is afforded the opportunity to fulfill its genes. The fawn grows into the majestic buck and runs as fast and jumps as high as it can. The hawk grows to soar as high as its great wings will carry it. To the same extent, every child born is entitled to an equal freedom, an education that provides the opportunity to become the best that the child can be. We have the ability to eradicate hunger and eliminate poverty. We have the ability to give our children their just dues as members of the society of creatures, we suffer only from having abdicated our moral commitment to do so, and thereby we have abdicated our membership in the society of creatures. I have made it clear I do not argue that mankind should share the wealth. Nature does not create man or any of its other creatures with equal needs, equal drives, equal talent, or equal responsibility. I only argue that we are, like the squirrel, created with an equal right to our natural entitlements, to adequate food, adequate shelter, an equal right to grow and to bloom, and an equal right to dignity and respect as members of the society of creatures. After every member of the species has enjoyed his or her natural entitlements, plenty remains for the acquisitive to squabble over. In the end we need not despair, for natural law will prevail. The sick, the deviant, the mad cannot long survive. In their place a new and healthy entity, a new and vibrant village, a new and caring community, a new and progressive free nation will take their places. A species that cannot control its populations, that cannot feed its masses, that cannot educate its children, that cannot respect its members, that cannot curb its greed, that cannot worship justice over power, that cannot reject evil over good and death over life, will in due time correct itself, since all life is finally subject to natural law. And the sooner we submit ourselves to such law, the sooner we and our children will know freedom. On Christmas Day, 1992, I sat down to compose a letter to my good friend Robert R. Rose, who was for many years my law partner and the former Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. Here's what I wrote. Dear Bob, On this snowy Christmas day I look out on the majestic Grand Teton, the top of its peak shrouded by an oncoming storm. No matter how relentless and bitter the cold, how deep the snow, how powerful the winds, the mountain seems never to change. No more than a passing thought or a brief encounter brings change to us. Yet in imperceptible ways, the mountain bears the marks of every storm. And like us, my dear friend, even the mountain is not immortal. I am told the Grand is a young mountain that like a sprouting adolescent, it grows a couple of inches a year. I see it as a rowdy teenager, uncivilized, unrestrainable, unpredictable, 
As for the storm, I think the mountain has no patience. When the mountain tires of the tumult and racket, it does not wait for the sun. It merely shrugs the storm away. But as inevitably as we grow old, so too will the mountain. I have seen the tops of old peaks worn nearly to the valley floor, the granite creased and wrinkled, the surface as smooth as a baby's cheeks. Yet they are still mountains. They are still fighting storms. At last they are still engaged in the ultimate folly of simply standing there. I think of all the storms you have survived and the courage I have taken from witnessing how you have weathered them. You have accepted your travails as if they were but vagrant clouds. I have seen the blizzards blind your eyes so that you could not read the words you wrote on the page. And I have witnessed the terrible fury that has descended upon your lungs. And still you are there, and like the mountain, an aura of joy soon enough shines through. That is the great mystery of your being, and of the mountains. On this Christmas day and during this same storm, our young bitch, Rosebud, had her first litter of pups. When the first pup was born, she licked it clean and nudged it to her, and it nourished itself even before its litter mates were born. For each in kind, she did the same. My own dear Imogene crawled into Rosebud's little closet and stayed with her until all the pups were born. It was late, and I knew that Imogene was tired and that from her long ordeal with surgery her back must have been very painful, especially crouched down with Rosebud in that tight little closet. I tried to convince Imogene to come to bed. I need to be here, she said. Rosebud knows more about having pups than you and I, I argued. Dogs have been having pups for millions of years. Imogene didn't answer. Come on, honey, I said. She'll be all right. I want to be here, she said. Then she sort of half-whispered to herself, You don't understand. And Imogene was right, of course. I do not understand. I am not wise enough to put this all together. I think you and Imogene know more about this process than I. I think old mountains also know. I think your wisdom, yours and the mountains, keeps you from defiling this knowledge with words. I had a conversation the other day with the mason who had just finished the fireplace in our home. You may have heard of him, John Bernardus of Casper, Wyoming, an extraordinary man as solid as his rocks and mortar. He built the fireplace of huge granite boulders, some weighing several tons, that had been dumped by the countless train loads at the foot of the mountain about 10,000 years ago when the last glacier receded. Glacial garbage, the geologists call it. The finished product was simple but monumental. John and I stood together admiring his work. A good pine fire was snapping away. Well, John, I said, you've achieved a little bit of immortality here. How's that? He looked surprised. This fireplace will be here long after we're both gone, I said. I suppose you're right, he said. And a hundred years from now, nobody will remember who owned this house and who built this fireplace. Both our names will probably have been lost to history, but this fireplace will still be heating somebody's backside and bringing pleasure. You should get a lot of satisfaction out of that. The man didn't say anything. He just gazed into the fire, and the fire lighted his face, and he looked very beautiful. Our names are important, but mostly to us. Immortality is usually nameless. A strange dynamic is at work here. Immortality is unconscious of itself. Those who seek it seem never to achieve it. Immortality is like trying to grab hold of one's breath on a cold winter's day. One only grabs hold of oneself. I think people who are unmindful of their contributions make the most lasting gifts. A mother who by loving her child teaches her child to love. A teacher who, adoring the innocent passion of the child, confirms for the child that it is all right to sing and to spread joy. Your own great gifts of love to generations of young lawyers who have seen you as a role model, as a lawyer, as a judge, as a man who has made us proud to be lawyers. 
Names soon fade on both the headstones in the cemetery and the headstones of human memory. You can walk through any graveyard and see the markers, many toppled over, the names beginning to disappear. I remember picking up a small stone that had once marked the grave of a child. It had been dislodged by what or whom I could not guess. I turned it over and put it back in its place. Although the name had been worn away, I could still make out one word that had endured the years. Darling. I held that small, cold, white stone in my hands. Those who had adored their darling were gone, and those who had loved them were likely gone as well. What survives? Love survives, but fear also survives, and superstition. I thought of the endless generations of mothers who believe their innocent babies are somehow born in sin, and that if their babies should die before the priests get their hands upon them, their children's little souls would be condemned to bob endlessly on the dark seas of purgatory. When, please, when was that darling child soaked in the evil brine? Such a notion was the original sin, an idea born of men who could not bear the thought that considering the condition of their own tarnished souls, they too had once been innocent babes. I should think it better that men accept the full width and breadth of their transgressions as the price paid for growth and wisdom, rather than unloading their sins on every newborn found at its mother's breast. Yet love, indeed, survives best. You, my friend, have already proven that. One young lawyer who has learned from your model that it is all right for lawyers to care about their clients and to fight for them can in a short lifetime touch many, and they, in turn, multitudes. Caring is contagious. In the end, love and joy and fear and hate are all immortal. With every breath, with every word, with every act, we touch eternity. As for wisdom, well, it too is like the fog. It can be seen, yet we can walk right through it. And when we think we have it, it vanishes. I have read thousands of those brittle opinions by the judges of our highest courts, and I have learned nothing, nothing at all. I have learned more from my children and my dogs than I ever learned from the scholars' dry and scaly volumes. This much I know. Truth, whatever it is, is simple. Truth, if we shall ever find it can be understood by even the most humble. And, my friend, I have learned more from my clients than from all of the experts and great men of science I have encountered. We can never forget the horribly injured we have fought for in the courtrooms. A father with critical parts of his brain destroyed, a woman carried into court on a litter who could not speak a word or even sit up, a paralyzed child, a mother with no arms to hold her baby, the terrorized poor, charged by the state with crimes they did not commit. They seemed so helpless, yet they became the most powerful persons in the courtroom. Our clients have taught us that we have all the power we need, all the power to live, all the power to bloom and to seed, all the power to endure, yes, and at last all the power we need to die. Religions? Ah, what religions do to us. How they supplant thought. How they fence out reason. How they render us impotent. How they poison us. The idea that one country, one people, one system is the chosen system. Those ideas are religions. Capitalism and communism are both religions that once left us standing helplessly by while the world's leaders in the name of their respective religions, plotted to destroy the world. The idea that the poor are poor because they are lazy, and that the rich are rich because they are not, is part of the dogma of free enterprise, and leaves half the world famished and in rags. Progress has become an icon in the church of money and things. Youth and beauty are the new gods of television. 
The idea that people are valuable only if they can convert themselves into saleable commodities, that the earth was created for the exploitation of man, that men stand above women, that some certain race excels, that the human species is superior to the other inhabitants of the planet, all such ideas exist as religions. Religions, whether spiritual, secular, political, scientific, economic, or social, all demand faithful acceptance. Religions are cages of the mind. I have seen many of our best and brightest captured at birth by religions, their minds bound like the feet of little Chinese girls, which in years past had also been religiously bound. When the babies became women, their feet remained stunted. I remember seeing many of these old women in China still hobbling about on their piteously crippled stumps. In the same way, I am saddened when I see whole populations, presumably without values of their own, become bound up by the ideas of tyrants, of reformers, of demagogues, of power mongers and hawkers of the beads and trinkets of our culture. I am saddened when I see people who, born free, deliver their freedom to government and then beseech their politicians not to sell them out to the highest bidder, to their enemies, to the corporate power center that will further enslave them. I am saddened to see valuable people selling their lives to soulless entities who consume them like any expendable material, like fuel, like fodder, like rags and parts are consumed. That people have accepted themselves as mere things to be bought and sold is part of a pernicious religion. On the other hand, the cry, power to the people, has become a disconcerting irrelevancy. We, the people, already have the power. We, the people, have always had the power. We need no leaders to achieve it no religions to claim it, no politics to express it. Our power does not come from parents or spouses or employers or the block captain or the priest or from God. If I understand that simple proposition, then I have changed, and the change is mammoth. The change is explosive. The change is freedom. I remember when I began to feel my own power, Somehow I had discovered the king within, the king of the self. I was fearful of the king, in awe of him. Yet in his presence I felt no servitude to man, to government, to law, or to God. I felt as if I could conquer any obstacle, win any case. Sometimes my enthusiasm amused you. Sometimes you tested these new powers. But always you gave me room, and you were patient. Sometimes I think you mistook my enthusiasm for courage. Perhaps at times you even admired it. I now know what I did not know then, that my exuberance merely paid homage to my newly discovered kingdom of the self. I shudder to think what might occur if all of the earth's people awakened their own inner kings. This much I can predict. Magically, overnight, the world would be free. When we acknowledge the kingdom of the self, we will no longer accept slavery either for ourselves or for others, no matter how it is disguised, for the king of the self cannot tolerate slavery. When we acknowledge the kingdom of the self, we will no longer tolerate untruths, for the king of the self cannot tolerate manipulations and lies. When we acknowledge the kingdom of the self, we will no longer permit the children of the world to be tarred with fear and feathered with guilt, for the king of the self cannot tolerate such abuse of the world's children. And when we stop abusing our children, we will finally enjoy peace. Yet the problem is that most reformers want our power. Our political reformers offer political reform in exchange for our power. Our social reformers offer social reform in exchange for our power. Jesus wanted God to have our power. His priests want the power for the church. The price we usually pay for reform is the delivery of our power to the reformers, whoever they may be. You, my friend, know I honor the law so long as the law honors the people. You know I am arguing neither for anarchy nor against a representative form of government. In the larger sense of government, we must be represented. But representation is not abdication. It is different from surrender. 
The king always acts through his representatives, but the king does not deliver his power to his representatives. We, as king of ourselves, must always reserve to ourselves our own power. That idea is ingrained in our system, but the idea has somehow been forgotten. James Madison understood that the American system was altogether different from the British, because, as he wrote, the people, not the government, possess the absolute sovereignty. Or, as Madison had said earlier in the House, quote, the sensorial power is in the people over the government, and not the government over the people. We should dispatch mere delivery persons to Congress, those who will carry our votes as we cast them, rather than sending those who, possessing our power, deliver our votes to the corporate core in exchange for power. Your decisions from the high court in Wyoming were uncommon decisions based on common sense and common justice, a simple acknowledgment of what is right and what is wrong for the human species. Strange that justice requires no machination of thought, no frilly rhetoric, no intricate syntax. Your decisions were not radical, but justice is usually labeled as radical, while injustice is often accepted as the standard. Yet we remember that once slavery in America was not seen as radical, it became instead a revolutionary idea that slaves should be freed. When we have lived under a pernicious power long enough, we grow so accustomed to the yoke that its removal seems frightening even wrong. For more than 200 years, like evil termites, disenfranchising ideas have gnawed away at the supporting timbers of American democracy. From the beginning, women have been vassalized. So have minorities. So have workers and artists and lovers of the earth. Far more deracinating is the historic progression in America that finds living people governed by non-living corporations that in a democracy, non-living corporations should own our legislatures, buy our presidents, select our judges, possess our airways, pollute our rivers, foul our oceans, and poison our skies. It is a wholly radical idea that people should be encouraged to hoard wealth without restraint, to nurture their avarice to full madness without caring for their less fortunate neighbors, who have been exploited in the process. It is a radical idea that we should destroy the earth, our home, and that we should ardently demand an unlimited right to continue in this demented act of terricide. The most radical of ideas is that profit is more important than human dignity, more sacred than human life. Over the years, those in power have endowed these radical, often cruel, and illogical rules with the dignity of right and law. That which is patently unjust has become justice. That which is obviously wrong has become right. That which opposes the position of power has always been labeled as radical. Our minds are like the willows along a high mountain stream that have been bent and bowed by the heavy winter snows. In the spring the snows are melted away, and although the willows bounce back, one can easily tell the direction in which the snows have bent them. It takes a good deal of bending of willows in the opposite direction to ever get them righted. One bending is not enough. It is now obvious to me that if there is worth in our lives, it is not because we have discovered anything new, but because we, as many before us, have rediscovered for ourselves simple truths. We are but a part of the process of man's eternal attempt to right the willows of the mind. What we have seen and what we have said to each other will be repeated again and again until the species shall have risen above myth, above religion, above the dull and mindless acceptance of ideas that bring hurt and enslavement to the human race. Until the willows of the mind shall have been righted against the snows of tyranny. Then, at last, we shall be free. When I came down this morning to see what the night had wrought, there in Rosebud's little closet lay seven tiny Labrador puppies, as black as little black rats, their eyes tightly closed so as not to view the harsh world too soon. 
And there lay Rosebud, weary from the rigors of the night, her puppies already sucking. Imogene, too, still lay sleeping, exhausted from having partaken in this magical affair called life. The snow continues to cover the valley. Now the Grand Teton is completely hidden, and you, my friend, seem far away. Yet I am connected to you, connected by life and on some dark day by death and by the eternal process that is God. I am also connected to the mountain and to Rosebud and to her puppies. I still cannot put this all together. I still do not understand. But I know that Rosebud and her pups and Imaging and you and the mountain are all involved in this conspiracy of life and death. That it is the process that must be cherished. I now see, my dear friend, that I too am part of this. That it is impossible for me to know more. And if I did, I would no longer be free. I dedicate this program to another dear friend, John C. Johnson, who joyously proves every day that freedom can be achieved by embracing both life and death as partners in the cosmos. <laughs>